Hey Guru Nation, welcome back to episode 69 of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. Occasionally I put these up on YouTube as well. If I think they're important or entertaining or whatever the case may be, I'll be doing another video later today for YouTube, just a short one. Uh, so today, lots, lots to get into. So first of all, people are asking me about how the CRO is going. So for those that may not know, uh, I, we've recently started a CRO, a contract research organization. Uh, we have uh, three small clients and we got our fourth uh, potential client, another small one as well. Uh, and I had my first bid and then I had my first bid defense uh, because the other projects that we got, we did not have to do bids. Uh, we were fortunate enough to just get the project. So I w this was the first time I was actually competing with other CROs. And of course, you don't know who you're competing with. They don't tell you. They sign CDAs, NDAs, whatever the case may be. And you won't know who you're competing with. But sometimes you don't even know how many you're competing with. In our case, I think they told us we were competing with five. But it came down to us and someone else. And they won it. But... There's always a silver lining. Well, there's two silver linings here. One, I went through the process. That's huge, right? That's probably the biggest one. Number two, this sponsor requires to use multiple CROs for their projects. So we're the we're in the runnings for their next project, which should start relatively quickly. So we'll be going through this all over again, but this time we've got our stuff down a little better. Uh, I'm going to actually go through some of the items that uh, go into a typical CRO budget without giving out prices because I, my team and I have talked about that, but we're still figuring this out, so we don't want to put anything out there. Um, first of all, we don't want to give out any just way off numbers, right, because we're still figuring this out as we go. But uh, there's something to be said about having a bit of a competitive advantage when it comes to that. I mean, we're we're so transparent, probably to a fault, on everything else we do when we talk about site issues and issues pertaining to patient recruitment and issues pertaining to getting studies for your site, business development, recruiting principal investigators. So, you know, we're plenty transparent with when it comes to other things. When it comes to CRO budgets we, at least for now, are going to remain um, a little more um, sealed off when it comes to sharing those kind of things. But if anyone wants to talk to me one-on-one -on -one, um, just about how to budget a uh, CRO bid, how to price it in, I'll be more than happy to help you out on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, so we're going to go through that, through the bid. We're going to go through some questions viewers gave uh, viewers sent and uh, we're gonna get into what is easier so probably one of the biggest questions I get asked from potential clients uh, is hey what sh like yesterday I had someone reach out to me Dan what should I do should I start a research clinic or should I start an SMO which is a site management organization. Or, sometimes I get, should I start a research site or a CRO? And it's, it's just, it's so shocking to me, and maybe it's because I'm in the industry, like I'm involved, I understand a lot of the minutia of uh, what goes on in this industry, but it, it boggles my mind to try to comprehend how someone without any knowledge of clinical research can want to start a CRO. Uh, it, there's just so, I mean, I've been in this industry since full time since 2005. Didn't start a CRO until 2016. That's 11 years. Didn't do my first bid until 2017. Uh, and when I went through this bid, there's a whole bunch of stuff I learned, like a whole bunch. So imagine if I would have started trying to do a CRO in 2005. I mean, it would have been impossible. First of all, you need to find 
the sponsors willing to work with a small CRO, a startup CRO, and that market's out there, right? That we're, we're, I've said it time and time again, we're in a biotech bubble, I believe. Um, there's a lot of investors throwing money out at biotech startups, and there's, there's been a period of a lot of easy money in biotech industry. So it's financed a lot of biotechs, many of which, when the market turns, whenever that may be, are going to go bust because that's what happens during bubbles. Bubbles expand and then they explode, right? They contract violently. So no one knows when that's going to happen, but ask anyone in the industry and they're going to tell you we're probably in a biotech bubble. Uh, so there's a market for these small CROs. Like, I'm not delusional. I do not think I'm competing with Quintiles or Covans or INC. Uh, we're not going after those sponsors. We're going after the sponsors you've never heard of. And we're basically the discount CROs for these sponsors. But, and again, I'm not a sponsor, so I can't speak from personal experience, but in my interactions with sponsors I have interacted with uh, in regards to CROs, sometimes they prefer the smaller CROs because they get more of a customized, attentive, all-hands-on-deck attitude when it comes to the CRO, which you just don't get at these bigger CROs. And so I think there is something to be said about being a niche CRO. And uh, look, we'll take what we can get right now as far as DSCS is concerned. There's no comparison. What is more difficult, running a CRO or running a research clinic? Okay, running the CRO is a hundred times more difficult. There are an obnoxious amount of more moving parts when it comes to a CRO. There are way more things that are out of your control when you're a CRO. For example, when you're a CRO, you have no control over patient recruitment. You can try to encourage the clinics all you want. You can try to come up with recruitment strategies until you're blue in the face, you cannot actually recruit patients. That's the research site's job. So, that and that's just one aspect, but that's probably the, the biggest aspect of it all is patient recruitment because that's 90% of clinical trials are delayed because of a lack of patient recruitment. So, infinitely easier to run a research site and, and I can't really talk about it too much because again, I don't have that much experience running a CRO. I mean, at this point, all of our projects are basically done at cost, meaning we're not losing money off of it, uh, but we're basically just buying ourselves, us, and I'm referring to the handful of people who work at the CRO right now. We're just basically creating our own jobs, right? Like, we're not, it's not, it's definitely not at the point where it's scalable, uh, we're building it. This is very much like what I did with the research clinics back in 05, 06, 07, 08. Then I started scaling in 09. Now I have research clinics I've never even visited. Okay, I have a research site in Chicago. It's been around for two years. I've never even visited it. And it's it's up and running. It's they just they're buying a, a DEXA scan today. Uh, they have two seven-figure budgets starting up, seven-figure study budgets starting up. So that's scalable. And yes, eventually the goal is for the CRO to get to that point. But I mean, I you know we can do that in the next five years. For the for these five years, from seventeen. From 16 until 2021, maybe 2020, I'm going to be in the trenches when it comes to the CRO, if we continue getting projects, uh, so knock on wood for that. Um, but it, it is just a lot easier, in my opinion, to run a research clinic than it is to run a CRO. First of all, there's a, a greater supply of opportunities when you're a research clinic. Um, so a typical research study needs multiple sites, whereas they only need one CRO. So it's a much smaller market and much more competitive market when it comes to CROs. It's competitive enough with all the sites starting up, 
but you're always going to have your little space because the sponsors and the CROs are looking for the physicians that have the patient database. And so, first of all, it's a lot more feasible to get started as a research site than it is a CRO because your selling point, your main selling point is your PI and his or her patients that you can enroll in the study. Whereas when you're a CRO, you don't really have a main selling point. It's just everything. I mean, let me just go down the list, and there's tons more. Right? I don't want to bore you. Study tracking system, study management oversight, collection and review of essential documents, IRB. You're in charge. When you're a CRO, you're in charge of selecting, procuring, budgeting, staying on top of the IRB. Same thing with the lab. Okay, You have to choose a central lab. Most studies use a central lab. Sites don't choose their labs, right? Sponsors and CROs choose which labs you use if you're in the 90% of clinical trials that use central labs. So as a CRO, you've got to procure the lab. You've got to uh, make sure that the monitoring is going uh, properly. SIVs, IMVs, site selection visits, closeout visits. You've got to take care of the CRA travel cost. Then you get into the EDC, EDC testing, QA, randomization, uh, then you get into project management, all the data management, uh, I mean there's just so much biostatistics. We even are into writing the protocols which many CROs stay out of. We actually, I mean we just want whatever business we can get at this point so we'll, we'll write your protocol if you want it. We just, Chris and I just did our first protocol synopsis recently, a couple weeks ago. You can see it on one of the vlogs. I believe that one is episode 8 or 7 where we're writing a protocol synopsis. And so I'm not mentioning all these items to impress you with what we're doing because it's, I mean, like I said, we're just learning this stuff ourselves. And there's a lot more. I just don't want to bore you to death with all these moving parts of a CRO. But you have to remain competitive when you're a CRO. So you go through the bidding process and then you go through bid defense where the sponsor comes back to all the CROs and say, okay, we need to get these costs down. And now you're cutting your margins. I mean, the one, the bid that we lost, we, we were only making enough money to pay ourselves, meaning the handful of people who are going to be doing all these things I just mentioned, and all of our vendors, like the EDC vendor, the IRB, the Central Lab. So we weren't going to lose money on it. We were actually going to make some money. Uh, but that, like, if I replace myself, because I was actually going to do the CRA activity, and I will on future projects, if I were to replace myself with a CRA to do the CRA duties, and then if I were to replace Chris with a project manager to do the project manager duties, and then we have a few assistants helping out, um, uh, TMF, which is Trial Master File, uh, Regulatory, we have, uh, what else is it, um, Data Management, which that one we outsource, but uh, still, that one's at cost. So basically, if we were to, to uh, replace ourselves with people we would need to hire, we would just be breaking even. Like we and. Even when you replace yourself with someone else, you're still involved because you're the one as the owner, as the executive or one of the executives. Uh, when there's an issue and there's always issues, you're the one that has to get involved. So there's not that much profits in, at least in these kind of projects that we're getting now. I, I've never been fortunate enough to have done a, a phase three um, multi-center study where I'm the CRO and I get to negotiate the budgets with the sites because in, in this, I, I do think that is, that is where some of the CROs make it their, their profit margins is when it comes time to negotiating budgets with the research clinics. Um, but as far as uh, just earning money off of these items, uh, there's very little there. Okay. Now again, this was a small project. All of our projects are small. Uh, as you start adding more sites, some of the things are scalable, and that's where the profits come in. Um, 
and and then on top of that when you're the CRO and you're able to negotiate budgets with the sites which in our case that wasn't going to happen with this particular project you can make up some money there this is why I tell all the research sites especially the brand new research sites get an experienced person to negotiate your contracts and budgets in fact this will be the uh, quick five minute YouTube video I do today get an experienced person to negotiate your contracts and budgets because the CRO is going to take advantage of you, okay? They already know going into it. I know this much. You're given a overall budget for the study, you being the CRO, okay? You go in with a bid. If you win the bid, that's your budget. You try to stay under budget. You rarely you rarely want to go ask for more money, okay? So you, you got to stay within that budget. Now, anything you spend within that budget is an expense. Anything you keep left over is your profit. Okay, so if you're a CRO and you need 90 sites and you know, let's say 30 of your sites are experienced sites that know how to negotiate budgets, yet at the same time you know that they're worth it because you're going to get the majority of your data from those sites. You're going to give them basically whatever they want within reason okay but you understand that you're gonna probably break even on those sites maybe even with some key opinion leaders and some really good experienced research sites uh, that provide good quality data and have a proven track record of doing this you might even lose money on those individual sites as a CRO well you're gonna make it a back up on the sites that don't know how to negotiate budgets right and maybe they enroll Instead of 10 patients, maybe they only enroll six, but instead of paying them $15,000 for a completed patient, you're going to pay them seven and a half, seventy five hundred dollars for a completed patient. And so you're now making $7,500 because you're, 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 within, you're well under budget on that individual site as the CRO. So, and, and this, this is actually probably the majority of sites, no, I shouldn't say the majority, but there's, so if there's 90 sites total in a study, and again, these are just ballpark numbers, if there's 90 sites total, 30 of the sites are going to produce 80% of the data. They're, they have a proven track record of, per, of providing quick enrollment or at least uh, solid enrollment, good clean data, no issues, very few protocol deviations, no headaches they're worth breaking even on or even losing a little bit of money on. Now that leaves 60 other sites so probably another 30 will not even negotiate their budget they're just so happy they've been selected um, and they might even be good sites they might be sites that end up enrolling and producing clean data and all that stuff but they just don't know how to negotiate budgets so those ones you're going to be making money on. And then the 30 others, because that's 60 so far, the 30 others you're either breaking even on or making a little bit on. Okay, that's, that's and I've, I've talked to a lot of people in the, at high levels at these CROs, that's how they do it. That's how they make their money. So in addition to scaling some of the things that they can scale, like project management, uh, CRAs, billing for their time, that's another one. You can budget, you can submit a bid, and say, hey, for a site selection visit, I want uh, 2500 bucks for a site selection visit as the CRO. If you hire someone and you put them on salary, and a CRA, you put them on salary, and you give them not only that study, let's say you give them two more studies and pay them 95 bucks an hour, but then fill up their calendar with 20 monitoring visits in one month and in one month they might be doing 20 site selection visits you're making 2500 bucks each time they go out but you're not paying them that much especially the salaried CRAs they're getting paid the same amount no matter how many site visits they have uh, so that's another area where the bigger CROs can make their money that is a double-edged sword because that tends to lead to CRA exhaustion, CRA burnout, and then CRA turnover, and then there's 
rehiring, new CRAs, retraining costs. Um, so there are issues there, but that is where CROs can make some of their money. Okay, so get someone experienced to negotiate your budgets if you're a brand new research site or a research site that is just not, a, not accustomed to negotiating budgets. There's an alarmingly large number of these sites out there that don't negotiate budgets. And so you're subsidizing everyone else and you're actually subsidizing helping that CRO become more profitable by not negotiating your budgets and you're hurting your colleagues who are also your competitors, other researchers, other investigative sites uh, because you're reducing their budget for future studies because you're helping create a new normal by not negotiating. So some things to keep in mind um, and I know someone asked me to do a day in the life of a CRA video I think I will I will either interview an experienced CRA uh, a salaried CRA like a real CRA not like me for those that follow me on YouTube and on the vlogs on Instagram you know that I'm I have a part-time gig as a CRA but what I do is not indicative of what a traditional CRA would do where they go to different cities and do site visits and have like three studies and eight different sites or in the case of one of my former students who's now a CRA she has 21 sites up and down the west coast um, like I don't have that kind of workload I have two sites I go to sites uh, just once every two months so uh, I'm not it, it wouldn't be fair for me to do a day in the life of a CRA because it wouldn't be indicative of what the norm is, but I will either interview someone or as soon as we start this CRO project, I will be the lead CRA and I could start doing a day in the life of a CRA because I will be that CRA. The only difference is I won't really have a line manager because I will be that as well. So I still think I will do that, but I will also, uh, to answer your question, uh, probably interview someone who is an experienced CRA and just go through a day in the life with them. So hopefully this helps. Definitely, infinitely easier to run a research clinic than it is to run a CRO. Obviously easier to run one research clinic than to run an SMO, which is essentially many research clinics scattered across the country. Nothing wrong with that business model, SMO. Uh, but they've developed a bad reputation over the years, all right? And also, I think it's actually easier to run a research clinic than it is to be a CRA, although it may not be as uh, secure. Your income may not be as secure, and it may fluctuate and have greater degrees of volatility as opposed to you getting a salary and a steady paycheck every two weeks, right? But I still think it's easier to run a research site than it is to even be an employee, an, em an employee and a CRA. Uh, again, just my opinion. Some people are going to have the complete opposite opinion, and that's fine, because everyone's different. Everyone's built differently. Uh, so that's episode 69. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast, leave a review, subscribe to YouTube, uh, like it, comment, and uh, stay tuned for my video on getting experienced people to negotiate. Talk to you soon. Take care.